iPhones have seen a lot of change over the years since their original introduction in 2007, and mainly for the better. iPhones are bigger now, faster, have multiple cameras, gorgeous displays, and are capable of so much more than anyone could have ever foreseen way back when. But alongside these objective improvements, there have been things that could be seen as a step back. iPhones have been no stranger to controversy, whether it be because of a quality control failure like the iPhone 4's antenna placements, or because of a specific design choice, such as that oh-so-infamous headphone jack removal. Courage. Amongst all these many changes iPhone has undertaken, there's one major one that was hugely controversial when it happened, but is now viewed completely differently in hindsight. The charging port switch, going from the 30-pin connector to lightning. It's easy to forget just how unpopular at the time this was, as it made all our old cables and docking stations completely obsolete. But moving forward, lightning was clearly superior in every way, and it didn't take too long for those initial polarizing reactions to subside. Even so, people do remember that switch pretty clearly, and it no doubt taught Apple some important lessons on how to handle this sort of situation once it inevitably would crop up again. So we're bringing USB-C to iPhone 15. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and with the iPhone 15 lineup officially unveiled, we now have confirmation to what rumors have been pointing to for years. Lightning is out, and USB-C is in. While the greater tech community will undoubtedly see this as a win, even if there are some typical Apple caveats included, the general public that's been using Lightning cables for years may not be so accepting. The reaction you're going to hear a lot is that Apple's changing the charging port again? Now, first off here, the last change did happen over a decade ago. But yes, your old cables will no longer work once you do upgrade to the new iPhone whenever that might end up being. So in today's video, I want to delve a little bit deeper into that original charging port switch and then take a look at how it compares to what we're seeing in 2023 and the pretty major differences in circumstances. Apple isn't really changing it because they want to this time around, but because of EU regulations. A controversial topic in and of itself, but for better or for worse, USB-C is replacing Lightning moving forward 11 years after Lightning replaced the classic 30-pin connector. And so let's go back in time 20 years ago to see where all this started and how we've managed to get to where we are today. There's the firewire connector, and there's a cable that plugs right into it, but the iPod also drops into a dock. This has been one of the most requested features we've had. Our story begins in 2003, with Apple launching their third generation iPod at a pivotal juncture for the company. The iTunes Music Store, along with Windows compatibility, came out in 2003 and would completely transform the way we consume media. It was the first actually decent and convenient online music store, finally bringing a true competitor to the rampant music piracy of the time. From this, Apple eventually would add TV shows and movies to iTunes, and it served as the catalyst to change the way we purchase and consume content. I point this out because this is when iPod and Apple really began to see their exponential growth as they rose at an unprecedented rate in both sales and overall market dominance. 2003 was the turning point when iPod would really live up to its full potential thanks to iTunes, and it was this iPod that first brought the ever so familiar 30-pin port, or the dock connector as it was referred to at the time. This was actually a big selling point for the iPod as the connector was a built-in way for the iPod to stand up comfortably on its enclosure dock. There's a reason why it's so wide. These were also the days when Apple didn't just include a single cable, but an overwhelming amount of accessories, something they would scale back on soon in order to lower the overall pricing of iPod. Third-party companies would end up picking up the slack, offering a huge variety of docking stations and accessories for iPod, which became a very lucrative market on its own. This benefited both those third-party companies and Apple, because, I mean, you gotta pay the piper if you want to use their technology. The original dock connector looks the exact same as the the ones eventually on iPhone, but originally utilized FireWire over USB. It doesn't really matter for the scope of this video, but FireWire was Apple's preferred port in the early 2000s until they gave in to USB for the sake of more universal compatibility. So this cord here does have a 30-pin connector, but on the other side is FireWire 400. This was a bit of an inconvenience, as while Macs all came with FireWire, Windows PCs more often than not didn't. And so with the crazy success of iTunes finally being on Windows, Apple soon switched over to USB, and this would lead to the familiar 30-pin to USB 2.0 cable that we all recognize today. And for a long time there, life was good. Again, the 30-pin connector made a lot of sense for iPods, built in a way that let them stand securely and safely in a dock. It wasn't a perfect system, but it was solid, and accessories based around the 30-pin port were sold in just massive quantities for years thanks to the iPod's popularity. Now we skip to 2007, and the first iPhone is launching. The 30-pin had been around for four years. It was a proven entity for Apple, and it served as a highly versatile connector 
connector with already a bunch of accessories on the market that would immediately be compatible with iPhone. So Apple fans that bought an iPhone and already owned an iPod had cables that would work with both. And by having a proprietary port in the 30 pin rather than mini USB or otherwise, gave Apple complete control over the experience. It was kind of a win-win for everyone. With all this in mind, it's no surprise the first iPhone was given that 30 pin charging port with the first iPod Touch later that year following suit, and then the first iPad in 2010 using it as well. iPods also continued to use the 30 pin port as new generations were churned out, with the exception of the tiny iPod shuffle. The first one was basically a flash drive, and then later ones used the headphone jack for USB connection. As time continued onwards, cracks began to appear in the 30 pin connector strategy, as well as some of the iPhones themselves, literally, with the iPhone 3G and 3GS being made of plastic and having the tendency to crack right around that port area. USB 2.0 was still extremely dominant, and no change was needed there. But there were some major flaws with the 30 pin, the main one being the size. While the width of the charger had made sense for the sake of dock connectors, the dominance of iPods was quickly fading. And for iPhones, it didn't actually make as much sense to have such a big port when the phones were only getting thinner, more compact. Everything was so squished into these little devices. Something you maybe forgot about was that the headphone jack was originally at the top of an iPhone, not the bottom. And part of the reason for this was because the dock connector took up so much space internally. Apple was doing their darndest to make their phones as thin and light as possible, but this port was a pretty clear obstacle, as it just did not utilize the limited space efficiently. iPods were much more simple internally than iPhones, as they didn't have a ton going on. All they really were made for was to play music, but on an iPhone, you had so many more components that you needed to cram into this tiny chassis. Apple needed that space, and on the Android side, they had micro USB, a much smaller, more convenient connector. But that solution was imperfect too, being neither as durable or as versatile as the 30 pin. Switching to micro USB wasn't something that Apple was ever going to do, as having a proprietary solution allowed for them to make additional revenue in licensing fees from third parties that all wanted to make chargers or accessories for iPhone, iPod, or iPad. We're talking millions upon millions of dollars at stake. If Apple moved to a universal standard like micro USB, pretty much anybody could make a cord for iPhone without paying Apple. So Apple would come up with their own connector in-house. And on the surface, it was a pretty significant upgrade. So a lot's changed and it's time for the connector to evolve. And that's just what we've done. Our new connector is called Lightning. This connector is a modern connector for the next decade. A modern connector for the next decade. Well, that turned out to be true. It's only now changing 11 years later. In late 2012, we would see the launch of the iPhone 5, Apple's slickest, slimmest, and most beautifully designed smartphone ever. As you had that premium aluminum casing that managed to be mind-bogglingly thin and light. And with it, we would see the brand new lightning ports replacing the 30-pin connector outright. And yep, there's the headphone jack right on the bottom now because they have space for it. This was an extremely controversial move at the time, as many people had already spent a pretty significant amount of money on accessories and cables that were, in an instant, completely obsolete. Now that is a slight exaggeration, as your current and older devices would still obviously work as they always had with the 30 pin, but don't forget that these were the much earlier days of smartphones where the leaps year to year were pretty darn big, which would encourage consumers to upgrade a lot more frequently than they might nowadays. Plus, phones were also just cheaper, so it was a bit easier to upgrade more frequently. iPhones also felt like they got really slow more often than not after a few years of software updates, as the newer updates were more and more demanding, and so an upgrade would just be inevitable at some point or another. And when that happened, well, all your old cables were now kind of useless. I actually remember my family had gotten a pretty nice docking station with a pretty good speaker on it, and we were all a bit choked when we realized it wasn't going to work with newer Apple products. Adapters did exist, but they were clunky, not that durable given how small and flimsy Lightning was compared to the 30 pins, and they may not have fit your docking station anyways, as these things were weren't designed with an inch tall adapter in mind. Still, objectively speaking, Lightning was clearly superior and it wasn't particularly close. While we were still looking at USB 2.0 and no real improvement to the underlying tech, the form factor was small and best of all, reversible. You could plug in the Lightning cable on either side of your phone's port, which might seem completely basic now, but was actually quite novel for the time. Android still used micro USB, which wasn't reversible, and this continued to be the case for years onwards until USB-C came around. So the convenience of Lightning really stood out. Gone were the days of trying to jam in your old charger the wrong way, potentially even scuffing up the casing around the port as you attempted to do so. From the consumer side of things, the port change did kind of suck, but as mentioned, it's not as if older devices didn't still do the exact same thing they always did. This change only happened with Apple's newest devices. They didn't retroactively change anything. So for example, the iPod Classic was still being sold in 2012 and never changed ports from the 30-pin connector, so your docking station or whatever would still work just fine with it. Just made a bit of a division, so if you 
bought an iPhone 4S in 2012 or 2013, you still had to use the 30 pin connector. The new port wasn't just a requirement, it was a new feature. It was something that was actually kind of desirable, but at the same time, at least you still had the option to opt for something older if you really didn't want to make the shift yet. The lightning switch definitely wasn't perfect, and I think there were some pretty major mistakes on Apple's part. A good example of this is the iPad third generation that came out in March 2012 and still featured the 30 pin connector. Its appeal was that it brought the Retina display for the first time on iPad, which was a huge upgrade and much sharper than the iPad second generation. Even so, its core specs barely beat out the iPad 2, and there really wasn't much change aside from the screen. So if Apple was going to change the port for all of their devices moving forward once the iPhone 5 launched, they couldn't have their newest, best iPad available using that old connector. So in only October 2012, like six months after they had released and heavily marketed their third gen iPad, out came the iPad fourth generation, and it was a significant upgrade on all fronts, bringing the much faster A6X processor, a way better 1.2 megapixel FaceTime camera rather than the pitiful 0.3 megapixels in the third gen, and then of course, the lightning port as opposed to the 30 pin. That iPad third generation never should have existed in the first place, and with the iPad 4's release, Apple just removed the iPad 3 from their lineup and forgot about it. They never sold it again aside from refurbished models, and just like that, you had the iPad 4, the iPad 2, and then the newly released iPad mini, making up Apple's iPad line by the end of 2012. If you bought the iPad 3, as my aunt did back in the day, you got completely screwed over. While there was a six month gap between the two tablets, don't forget that people don't buy things immediately. How many poor customers bought the iPad 3 right before the new one came out? And why would you expect a new one to come out when the iPad 3 had come out that year already? Now, not only was this customer stuck with a vastly inferior device that would end up painfully slow in a few short years, thanks to iOS updates, but they also had the old 30 pin connector to boot. I bring all this up because I think it's probably the most egregious casualty of Apple's switch to Lightning, one that could have been handled so much better by just waiting six extra months for the iPad 3. All in all, when it comes to the Lightning transition back in 2012, I would argue that it was mainly well done. The switch was fairly smooth and gradual with older products still using the legacy connector, and whenever you did end up upgrading to the iPhone 5, 5S, or 6, or whatever it was, in the box would at least come both that classic charging brick as well as the all new Lightning to USB cable. The Lightning port would be a mainstay until, well, today, really, as it got the job done, and it did it really well. After a number of years, people would regain their junk drawer full of old cables and accessories compatible with current iPhones, and soon enough, the 30 pin would fade from memory. This doesn't quite bring us up to the iPhone 15, however, because Apple would slowly begin changing the ports on basically everything except for the iPhone. As mentioned, Lightning was vastly superior to the alternatives used by Android competitors when it originally came out. But while Apple was content to keep things as is, technology kept advancing. So now it's the mid 2010s and technology is rapidly shifting. And wouldn't it be convenient if you didn't need to bring around so many different cords and different connectors all the time? This is where USB-C would enter the picture. It's reversible for one thing, which is awesome. It's small, a little bit bigger than lightning, but still very small and could easily fit on any smartphone. And best of all, it's fast. And the technology behind it was vastly superior to that of traditional USB. Android devices quickly began adopting USB-C, some faster than others, but it really became the ideal port for your phone in 2015 onwards. Apple sees this, and they know they need to jump on the train. The big benefit of USB-C is that while generally classic USB ports have been used for mainly just data transfer, USB-C was capable of doing anything and everything all at once. It could provide more power, it could be used for more data, and it could also replace HDMI and display ports, even audio jacks. One port could do absolutely everything for you. Not every USB-C cable is designed to be so universal, especially with many of the very cheap cables out there, but the potential here is pretty enticing. USB-C also provides power delivery a lot faster than traditional USB, hence the quick adoption of fast charging features seen on the Android side when they all made the move over. The bottleneck often was the charging brick rather than the cable, but they did sort of go hand in hand. Apple knows they need to do something, so they do, and it's something that had it actually worked out may have been really good for the industry. The system's much faster and so is the I.O. It is the fastest, most versatile I.O. we've ever built into a MacBook Pro. They would get rid of all of their ports on their MacBooks and replace them with USB-C only. Your brand new MacBook Pro had four USB-C ports and that's it. Any of those ports could be used for charging and data transfer, hooking up to a display, you name it. The problem here is that the rest of the industry didn't follow suit, at least not fast enough. And it left Apple's customers forced to buy ridiculous dongles and adapters to be able to use their computers with literally anything. If you were a photographer and owned a MacBook Pro, you couldn't just pop the SD card into your computer, you had to bring 
bring a dongle with you. If you had a school presentation, you couldn't just plug your MacBook into the projector, you had to use a dongle in order to get an HDMI port. The only thing Apple let us keep was the headphone jack of all things, whereas the iPhone 7 in 2016, of course, got rid of that to help sell AirPods. Apple jumped the shark with their MacBooks, and the worst of it is, I actually think this could have gone a lot better had they committed to USB-C properly, but they didn't, at least not really. iPhones still used the lightning port, and iPads did as well, at least at first. Not only this, but those lightning cables that came with your device used traditional USB-A. So if you bought a top-of-the-line iPhone 7 to use with your top-of-the-line MacBook Pro in 2016, the cable included in the box wouldn't even plug into your laptop. In 2017, Apple would finally bring fast charging to the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and iPhone 10, but the power cable and adapter you got in the box were still the old-fashioned USB-A. If you wanted to use fast charging, you had to buy the separate lightning to USB-C cable from Apple along with their new, larger 18-watt charging brick. The fact that Apple moved to USB-C on their laptops but didn't even sell their iPhones with a cable that worked out of the box is absolutely ridiculous, and is in my opinion a big part of the reason Apple's USB-C switch ended up failing so spectacularly. In 2018, the new iPad Pro had its slick, thin bezel design swapping out the lightning port for USB-C, marking a new era of iPad. The more affordable iPads, up to the ninth generation released in 2021, still had lightning connectors, and that sort of made sense. The higher-end iPad had a higher-end port. Unfortunately, the headphone jack did get removed from USB-C iPads, but this didn't get as much flack because the iPhone 7 had done the same thing years prior. USB-C on iPad was the right move, especially since Apple was really pushing their iPad Pro as a full-on computer replacement rather than just an oversized smartphone. In 2019, Apple would finally include in the box for the iPhone 11 Pro and 11 Pro Max both a Lightning to USB-C cable as well as an actual full-on 18-watt power adapter. Rejoice! Apple has blessed us with an included fast charger that high-end Androids had been including for years already, and all it cost you was, you know, $1,000 for the phone. Even with this, for whatever reason, Apple still included the old USB-A cable they always did for the non-pro iPhone 11, as well as that tiny 5-watt adapter. Still, it seems like they were heading in the right direction. Until 2020 rolls along, the iPhone 12 comes out, and Apple decides to just not give us charging bricks at all. Yeah, so even the iPhone 12 Pro didn't come with an actual charging brick. Apple claimed they were just doing their part to reduce e-waste by getting rid of the bricks that came with their phones. A lot of people had a lot of those 5-watt bricks, so fair enough to an extent. Frankly, they had become a dime a dozen and definitely could qualify as e-waste. But they switched over to USB-C without ever including a brick for that, aside from the 11 Pro. The reality here is that Apple wasn't trying to save the environment, they just didn't want to include those bigger 18-watt power adapters. The 5-watt ones were long out of date in both charging speeds and USB-A, so the solution was to just get rid of the brick altogether and pass that increased cost off onto the customer at a marked up price. And unfortunately, a lot of smartphone makers have since followed suit with this, only providing the cable in the box. Apple, of course, also got rid of those ear pods altogether that had been included free since forever. The headphone jack dongle also was absent from the box since the iPhone XS launch in 2018. These were strictly anti-consumer moves, and the environmental argument is clearly not the real reason Apple made these changes. While reducing the packaging size is commendable, as well as getting rid of the high quantities of plastic, getting rid of the actual useful things inside the package was always their true goal in this. Mind you, I don't have a problem with necessarily all of this, like with earpods. I don't think those need to be included because they're not an inherently necessary part of the experience. I wasn't too pleased when they stopped including the headphone jack dongle, but that was more because of my overall annoyance towards the headphone jack removal being a thing in the first place. But in any case, those accessories were just that, accessories. You don't need earbuds or a headphone jack dongle to be able to use your iPhone. What you do need is both a cable to charge your phone and something to plug that cable into. Not only does Apple get to save money by not including these basic accessories with their phones while still charging the same price for less products, but they now also get this added chunk of change that people have to spend to be able to charge their device in the first place. How absurdly insane is that? And how many millions and millions of dollars in revenue has Apple gained from this move? Originally here, and I, I kid you not, I had about another page and a half written ranting about how terrible this change was, but I think we'll go ahead and try to move on. The big thing I really want to point out is that for users who didn't already have a charger they could use and didn't have a USB-C port to plug their new cord into, what they essentially were buying was a thousand dollar paperweight until they could go out and purchase the extra accessory. That's inexcusable, full stop, and I think Apple deserves so much more backlash for this than they got. The environmental excuse is perfect because it sort of acts as a shield against criticism. Nobody wants it to look like they don't care about the planet. And it's not like Apple doesn't have some really 
great initiatives that show to some extent they do care, or at least they care about making their public image look good, but in this case, all they're doing is using the environment as an excuse to save millions and millions of dollars, and I think it's a damn shame. But alright, let's step back here. Apple actually hasn't been all bad in recent years. Finally, in 2021, the MacBook Pro brought back the MagSafe charger, which was sorely missed, along with the SD card slot and HDMI, and of course, we still have USB-C. This is what Apple should have done back in 2016, rather than just getting rid of the ports altogether and hoping everybody would just be on board with that, but you know, better late than never. And it's with this that we're brought to today. Now, the same cable can charge Mac, iPad, iPhone, and even AirPods Pro second generation, which is updated with a USB-C connector. Lightning is pretty brutally out of date at this point, still using USB 2 speeds that the 30-pin cables were capable of. Over a decade ago, almost two decades ago actually, USB-C on iPhone seems like the obvious next step, as it's become a massive part of their computers and the sole port on iPad. As such, we've had rumors circulating for years now saying that the new iPhone would finally make the switch from Lightning to USB-C, and yet it would just never happen until the iPhone event September 2023, when Apple finally made the jump and in typical fashion are acting as if it's the greatest, most life-changing, groundbreaking innovation since the wheel. Or at least that's what I would normally expect from Apple, but it was actually kind of the opposite. I was surprised they didn't talk about USB-C more. They sort of just glossed over it, and with some further inspection, I think the reason is pretty clear. The faster transfer speeds you get with this USB-C is only available on the iPhone 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max with those A17 Pro chipsets even though it would be easy for them to stick it on iPhone 15 had they actually wanted to. But Apple would rather call it a pro feature and make it a selling point for their highest priced phones. Even though USB 3 has been pretty common on Androids for a while, it's just so horrendously typical of Apple that the 15 and 15 plus, $800 and $900 phones would be stuck with the same old USB 2 transfer speeds. I can't get over this. I don't even know how to properly express just how wildly stupid this is. Ultimately, most people probably don't care about the transfer speeds because they hardly ever plug in their phone to move something back up or update. Pretty much everything can be done wirelessly, which is convenient, and so that's what most people will continue to do. The USB 3 support being a pro feature actually makes a lot of sense, because it's helpful for those really taking advantage of things like raw photos, ProRes videos, the features that take up huge amounts of storage and need to be moved over to, say, your MacBook. But it should have been a pro feature on their phones even like a few years ago, not today, when USB 3 support is almost entirely ubiquitous across the industry. And Apple's late to the party, and they're including their typical caveats as always, but at least they're unable to restrict charging to their own cables, at least fully, as the EU won't let them do that. That was rumored at one point, that if you plugged in a non-Apple licensed USB-C cable, you'd get a pop-up basically telling you that the phone would limit charging speeds, and maybe wouldn't let you transfer files using it, because, you know, it wasn't an official Apple cable. The EU very specifically said Apple couldn't do that, so luckily that shouldn't be happening, but this long drawn-out transition to USB-C could have easily been solved, had Apple Apple switched over with the iPhone X in 2017. Their MacBooks had recently gone USB-C only, and the iPad Pro was about to make the jump as well. Their higher-end iPhone X bringing USB-C at the same time as all of its other many changes would have made perfect sense, almost too perfect. But then Apple wouldn't be able to make the killing that they have on lightning cables over the years. Everything is always going to be centered around money, but Apple's penny-pinching these recent years is really starting to wear on me as time goes on. Steve Jobs was always so concerned about the user experience, concerned with putting the customer above all else, because if they're happy, they're going to continue buying your products. Since Tim Cook took the reins as CEO, Apple has gotten significantly worse with repairability, port selection, and basically with anything that could possibly benefit the customer from a financial perspective. While Apple definitely wasn't great with this sort of thing under Jobs, at least all the time, it was a completely different company, and at least in my opinion, wasn't nearly as fixated with cutting corners wherever possible to add a few more billion dollars to the already insane amount of money that they've got just sitting doing nothing. In part, I think it's because Apple has become complacent. When Jobs was still around, Apple was successful, but they had to still keep pushing the envelope as their competitors would easily overtake them if they weren't careful. But these days, Apple can afford to be complacent. People will keep buying iPhone, and Apple will keep screwing us over in any way they possibly can. They might do some things right, like software support, but it's hard to give them as much credit as maybe they even deserve when they so frequently 
frequently choose to get those little things wrong. Just look at what the iPhone SE costs right now. I did a video on that. It's absolutely absurd and is just a joke. The iPhone 15 and 15 Pro getting USB-C is a very good thing. It might suck for users who have a huge quantity of lightning cables and accessories that are now useless, but it's a change that benefits everyone in the long run, even if the EU's regulations being the cause is a bit worrying. Government regulations like that on a foreign company, no less, is a scary precedent and could lead to stifled innovation in the future. But for the moment, we finally got USB-C. I've complained a ton this video, but I do think we deserve a moment to be happy about that. That original vision of USB-C that Apple lazily tried to push with their removal of ports on their laptops is finally being achieved. One single cable can now charge your MacBook, your iPad, and finally, your iPhone. Our goal is to make the best personal computers in the world and to make products we are proud to sell and would recommend to our family and friends. And we want to do that at the lowest prices we can. But I have to tell you, there's some stuff in our industry that we wouldn't be proud to ship, that we wouldn't be proud to recommend to our family and friends. And we can't do it. We just can't ship junk. And what you'll find is our products are usually not premium priced. You go, you go and price out our competitors' products, <clears throat> and you add the features that you have to add to make them useful, and you'll find in some cases they are more expensive than our products. The difference is we don't offer stripped down, lousy products. You know? It is very easy to complain and rant as I've done this video, but I also did purchase the iPhone 15 Pro and am extremely happy to be able to use USB-C, timing and circumstances aside. Maybe I'm a hypocrite, or maybe I'm just an Apple user who really wants them to be better because I know they're capable of it. And this is a step in the right direction, along with how the back glass on the new iPhones should make for easier repairability. I think that's awesome. That's the kind of thing I wanna see more in the future. So with that, I think we can safely wrap this video up. Up. Maybe not the most satisfying conclusion, but USB-C, it's here now. It's a good thing, even if the change is coming because Apple's being forced to do it, rather than them actually innovating. Honestly, I really didn't mean for this video to get so long or so ranty. It just ended up that way, and turned out to be much more work than a quick run through Apple's charging port history. But hopefully you enjoyed it, and if you actually made it this far, I would really appreciate you hitting that like button. It helps a ton, especially since the YouTube algorithm really doesn't like pushing my videos these days. Also, maybe subscribe if you haven't. That would be pretty cool of you. Huge shout out to the channel channel members, by the way. I can't thank you guys enough for the support. It means so much to me. I don't say that enough, but it, it really does. I do have social media that I probably should use more often if you're interested in following me at 91 underscore tech. And with that all being said, thank you so much for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.